Kharkov, Ukraine. After the seminar, she told me I had never given a second thought to the Jewish people. This seminar has opened my eyes. I can't wait to befriend a Jewish person and share Christ with him. Amen. Galena's testimony thrilled me. It expressed so many important things. Like most Christians, Galena had never given serious thought to sharing the gospel with Jewish people. The Jewish Evangelism Seminar equipped Galena with the Bible knowledge and practical information to witness to Jewish people. The most fruitful way to share Christ with a Jewish person is through an ongoing process of befriending, loving, praying, and patiently sharing gospel truth. That kind of witness will bear fruit. Each of us is personally responsible to witness to Jews and to Gentiles. Our dream is that Christians across America and around the world will do exactly what Galena is doing. Imagine great harvests will reap if we do this. We coordinated performances of The Hiding Place at two Atlanta area churches. The Shining Light Players of Pensacola, Florida presented a gripping musical drama telling the story of Christians in Holland who risked their lives to save Jewish people from the Holocaust. We worked hard to promote the event, making special effort to reach Atlanta's Jewish people. We passed out personal invitations, advertised on Facebook, placed an ad in a Jewish newspaper, and invited the congregations of 13 synagogues. At one of the performances, 160 visitors attended, including 15 to 25 Jewish people. Each person was touched by the superb drama and music, by the inspiring story, and by the powerful presentation of the gospel. Rhonda and I are so thankful for the Lord's blessing that we thank him for you, your support to the partnership and the ministry, for your love and prayers, and your support. May your holidays be filled with his richest blessings. Please pray for the light bearers, for Christians to love and share Christ with their Jewish neighbors, for Jewish souls to be saved, and then our family, Rhonda's health, Joshua and his fiance, Allie, Daniel and Kendall, helping churches to reach Jewish people, Sam and Rhonda Wilson. All right. Prayer guide. Anybody need one tonight? Everybody get one? All set? Good. All right. Uh, the coming events will... Uh, we will not have an RU inside tomorrow night. They've canceled that at the prison. They have something else going on, and so that's been postponed. Um, we will have it Friday night right here at the church, though, 7 o'clock, our RU program. And on Friday night and Saturday morning, they're out at London at 8.30, and we'll have our soul winning visitation at 10 a.m. Now, listen, we had, as you'll see on the inside, uh, 77 first-time visitors on Sunday, so we've got a lot of folks to go visit. And uh, so if you want to, if you can't come on Saturday and you can make a visit tomorrow night or something, see me after the service and I'll give you a visit or two to, to call on tomorrow night of folks who were here Sunday and uh, we can go back and visit them uh, and get, get on these visits just as quickly as possible. Brother Booth is coming. Uh, he'll be in town and uh, he'll be uh, preaching down in Lancaster on Sunday morning and he'll be with us on Sunday evening. And so we'll look forward to that on Sunday night, Evangelist Tim Booth. Okay, and then reminder, next week is on Tuesday night uh, instead of Wednesday night. Okay, so Tuesday night service, remember that for our worker appreciation. Uh, so some of you might have to travel for Thanksgiving. You won't miss Wednesday night church, okay? On the inside is uh, praise reports and um, 14 at London on Saturday. They had one new man and one received Christ as their Savior. Uh, 270 at dinner day, and of course 12 were saved and three baptized, and 77 first-time visitors, counting the, the families and the children that were here. So a wonderful, wonderful Sunday, all right? Continue to pray for the different church requests and the ministries here. And then, of course, these on our health list. Continue to pray for them. And uh, I wanted to update that, and I didn't bring it with me. Um, I think I can remember it. Paula Ross is out of Mount Carmel. Uh, they have transferred her to, um, it's at 1460 South High Street. I don't, I don't know, I remember the name of the hospital there, or care, whatever that thing is. It used to be one of the old Mercy Hospital, maybe. Uh, does that sound right? Okay. That's where she is, and uh, uh, room number five. 
okay, on the second floor, room number five. So, but 1460 South High Street, doing much better, uh, much improved, and uh, continue to pray for a full recovery for her. And uh, she is up to having visitors. If anybody wants to stop by and chat with Paula, she'd love to see you, okay? And uh, then, of course, we're praying for those in authority uh, in our country and our leadership, especially as the transition is made. Uh, we pray for our military and those defending our country around the world, and we pray for these battling cancer, and then we pray for the salvation of the folks on this list, uh, loved ones and friends of people here in the congregation, that uh, they'll come to know Christ as their Savior. Uh, we pray for unreached people groups in the world, and that God would send forth laborers uh, to these folks who have been unreached with the gospel. And then, of course, pray for our missionaries, highlighted tonight by the Wilsons, who are endeavoring to reach the Jewish of people all right and uh we want to have uh prayer this evening i'm going to have where's brother taylor brother taylor here there you are brother don would you come tonight and lead us in our prayer this evening and brother taylor will lead us audibly and uh we'll pray along with him as uh he prays uh out loud we'll pray along with him silently and we unite our hearts together in prayer that way so when he mentions uh something he's praying for you pray right along with him it keeps your mind from wandering away on other things but you unite your heart together in prayer. Right? Let's do that right now, all right? Let's bow. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, Lord, we thank you for this place where we can come and worship together. Lord, we owe it all to you. Thank you for making a way that each one of us, Lord, can come to your throne of grace as we seek mercy, Lord. Father, we, we lay these petitions before you. Lord, we got so many on the, on the health list needing a touch of your hand. And Lord, we... We believe in our hearts that if it's your will that each and every one of these will be touched by you today, even as we speak, Lord. Some, Lord, are facing dire, life-threatening illnesses, Lord. We just ask that you'd encourage them as they go through this time. Bless them, Lord, and we'd ask for a healing for each one of them. Father, our church ministries, Lord, each and every one of them is so important. We just ask for your blessings on those as well. Bless our pastor and Mrs. Slayball, Lord, in their daily lives. And we just pray that you continue supplying all their needs. We lift them up to you and bless them, Lord, with good health as well. And Lord, help all of our deacons and our bus ministry, especially the radio ministry, Lord. It reaches out and touches so many lives. And all these other ministries, Lord, we just we can't do nothing without you, but we can do everything through Christ that strengthens us, Lord. And we thank you for helping us with these ministries. And I do praise you, Lord, for the men out there at the London Correctional Institution, Lord, where a new one was saved. Pray for the the guys out at Orient, the CRC. It's be weeks now until we can get back in there. Just ask, Lord, that you put a hedge of protection about those that are new Christians and they're babes in Christ, Lord, and they need you. They need that Holy Spirit guide them and place them around other Christians there that can help them stand. Keep them safe, Lord, and until the next time we can get back in there, Father, and just put someone in their path that will help share the gospel with them, that will strengthen them. 
Thank you for the visitors that we had here on this past dinner day. And the soul saved there, Father. You let us see the fruit right there on the very day, Lord. And three baptized. And pray that the others are also thinking about this baptism and that they'll come back. Father, this salvation list, Lord, there's so many there that are lost. Been on there for a long time, Father. But we're not giving up on them. We're still lifting their names up to you, each and every one of them, Lord. We we ask that you put a burden on their hearts and call them, Lord. Father, there's many that each and every family here has got lost ones. And I included, Father, I lift them up to you also. And I just pray that you bind the strong one. Remove the blinders from the, their eyes that they would see and know that there's forgiveness for them too. Father, I pray for this, all of them here on the cancer list, Lord. That cancer is a terrible thing to hear when you've got it. And just pray that you'd heal these folks. And Lord, get, encourage them. Put someone in their life that will lift them up, Lord, and share their burden. Military's family, Lord, we just ask that you bless them and keep them safe tonight wherever they are around the world. It seems like there's so many that are being attacked viciously, Lord, by all avenues. I just pray that you give them a good night's rest. And Lord, praying for all these in authority. Pray that the America will start turning back to you. Father, I do pray for the president-elect. Lord, he's getting ready to appoint people into different offices that are so meaningful and so powerful, Lord, and so influential. I pray that each and every one of them that will have a heart to do not only what's right, but what would be pleasing in your sight. And each step maybe help turn America back to you and get some of these evil, wicked laws repealed. Father, I pray for all the unreached people groups here on this list and, and even the ones that are not, Lord, as the word is being taken around the world to them and new Bibles being printed in their languages, Lord. I just pray that it would all go well and the money and the finances would come in, Lord. That you would supply it. You already have supplied it. I just pray that people would be a, a vessel willing to obey. Father, all these missionaries, every, each and every one of them, Lord, I pray for them all. Give them health and bless them, Lord, as they're out and about and spreading the gospel. Bless the Wilson family, especially tonight, Lord, and the letter that was read, and just supply their needs, give them health, and we love you, Lord, and Father, be with the pastor as he opens up your word tonight. Help each and every one of us to be attentive on what the pastor has prepared out of your word. Help us to be attentive and to pay attention and and not distracting, Lord. May everything that's said and done tonight be pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's turn to 180 in our hymnal. 180, be not just made whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Would you stand with me as we sing? 180 on that first together. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you through days of 
one another make somebody feel welcome especially our guests we'll come back and sing that last t- together care of you through every day or all the way he will take care of you God will take care of you no matter what may be the test God will take care of you let's sing that last stanza together no matter what may be seated good singing tonight you believe God will take care of you amen Amen. yes he does and uh, I do have a note here from the Wednesday night glow club they wanted to thank everyone for their support on uh, Sunday night when they had the snacks after Sunday night service uh, on the 6th 
So because of your generosity, and I probably should put in their appetite, uh, they were able to receive $170 for the three missionary families that they're supporting. So that's great. And uh, thank you so much from uh, the Glow Club on Wednesday night there. All right? That's exciting. They were, they were thrilled about that. So thank you for helping them help the missionaries. That's a good thing. All right, let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing on our offering this evening. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to give back a portion to you of what you've given to us in total. And Lord, we do believe what we just sang, that you will take care of us. And thank you for how you take care of us, Lord. And thank you for how you provide for the needs of your work here in this place. We pray your blessing on the offering tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 6, please. Ephesians chapter 6 for our scripture reading here this evening as we look again at the armor of God and our spiritual warfare. Tonight we are on verse 17 where the Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation, Ephesians 6 and verse number 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Father, I ask for your help as we uh, look at this piece of the armor here this evening. As we understand, we are in spiritual warfare, and we understand who our enemy is and who we're fighting against. And I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the armor of God to protect us and for it to help us to be victorious in the warfare, in the combat against Satan. Now, Father... Uh, please help us as we study your word tonight and we uh, dig out the truth here and we understand exactly what it means to have, the, have on ourselves the helmet of salvation. Help me as I bring the truth and please help each individual say, listen tonight. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. We've, we've talked about our loins being girt about with truth. We talked about having on the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We talked about taking last week, taking the shield of faith, where we'll quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. And tonight, we'll talk about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. You know, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3 is a very interesting verse. If you want to look there with me, the Bible says, For I fear, lest by any means has the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the Bible here makes it clear our minds can be deceived by Satan's subtlety. Subtlety is his cunningness. Subtlety is his slyness. Uh, he beguiled Eve. He, he tricked her by, and, and he, he, he eluded, he got her by, it's his strategy. He, he is very strategic in what he does. 
And He targets our mind. He targets our thoughts. He's very subtle and He's very clever with His lies. We're not going to stand against His lies unless we have a very clear and sure understanding and knowledge of the truth. The best way, uh, I, I'm, I'm told I never worked in a bank, and those who have worked in banks and handle money a lot, I understand, uh, they don't have you handle counterfeit money. They have you handle real money. And the, you know what the real money feels like, so you'll be able to know exactly what the counterfeit feels like. Uh, you'll just know there's something not right with the feel of this. And, and the, the way to understand all the deception and lies of Satan is not to study all the deceptions and lies. It's to know the truth. And when you know the truth, you'll know the lie when you see it. And so we have to know the truth and understand uh, God's truth about our full salvation. And I want you to understand, we have a full salvation. Sometimes you hear people talk about, are you a full gospel church? Well, yeah, we believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and by the way, we have a salvation that is, it's a salvation that delivers us. Salvation means deliverance. And it is deliverance from our past sins. It is deliverance from, from the penalty of sin. We're never going to die and go to hell. Okay? All of our sins are forgiven. But wait a minute. It's also a present salvation. That means I can have victory over sin now. I don't have to succumb to sin now. Let not sin have dominion over you. It's a matter of me letting, okay? It doesn't have dominion over me anymore. That's my present salvation. But wait, we also have a future salvation. It's not complete yet, because it's not complete till we get rid of this body of flesh, and this corruptible puts on incorruptible. This mortal puts on immortality. We get the final part of our salvation when the redemption of the body takes place. And so that's full salvation. And again, what he's, I think he's saying here is you, you need to understand, you need to have a firm intellectual knowledge of what your salvation entails. Now, let me, let me give you something that I read this week that I thought was very, very interesting. This, this piece of armor called the helmet, uh, it's, when, when you put the words together for this helmet, it's a piece of armor that fits very tightly around the head. I don't think a helmet like we think of helmets that people wear today or soldiers might even wear today. This was something that the Roman soldier's helmet was a, was a very fascinating and flamboyant piece of armor. It was very ornate and very intricate. It was highly decorated with all kinds of engravings and etchings. In fact, the helmet looked more like a beautiful piece of artwork than a simple piece of metal formed to fit the head of the soldier. So it wasn't uncommon for a Roman helmet to be decorated with depictions of farm scenes or uh, complete with all kinds of animals. In fact, sometimes the helmet was fashioned to look like an animal. And so the, the, some of the helmets had an intricate engravings and etchings uh, upon them. So, and if that wasn't enough for people to, to, to look at and draw attention to them, often there was a huge plume of brightly colored feathers or horsehair that would stand straight up from the top of the helmet. And, and this is the helmet, if you get a picture of what this looks like. It was, it was like a parade helmet, like you would be on parade and everyone would be able to see you. And it would, uh, that, that plume would stand up and sometimes went down, it would be long enough to go all the way down their back. And so it was, uh, it was made of bronze, it was equipped with pieces of armor that was designed to protect not only the head, but the cheeks and the jaw as well. And, and we'll tell you why there in just a minute. It was extremely heavy, and so sponge was put inside of the helmet to protect it and make it a little easier to, to sit on their head because of the sheer weight of the, 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 the uh, helmet. And so the piece of armor was strong, it was massive, it was heavy. Nothing could pierce it. Not an axe, not even a hammer. Now... It would be very difficult then if this, you, you picture this in your mind, something wrapped around his head, it's ornate, it has etchings in it, it may be the shape of an animal, it's got a huge plume on the top of it. You, you wouldn't walk by a soldier without noticing that that's a soldier. You would be very aware that that's who this was. It made the Roman soldier very noticeable. And, and, and you think, now why would the Spirit of God 
tell us here to put on the helmet of salvation. And this was the picture people would have when they picture a, a Roman soldier and his helmet. Because salvation is the most gorgeous, intricate, beautiful gift that God could ever give to us. And it ought to make us stand out from anybody else. It ought to make us noticeable to anybody else that we have a great, as the Bible calls it, so great salvation. And so it's the helmet of salvation. And, and it would be uh, definitely noticeable. Now it's interesting. The, that, that helmet would be so tight upon the, the Roman soldier's head that because, and the reason that was important in protecting the jaw was the enemy carried things, and they all carried them in those days, called battle axes, okay? And, and uh, they would literally try to take your head off uh, as they got close in battle. So you needed something strong, because uh, when they went to battle axes in the war, heads would roll, literally, okay? And so you had to be careful. And so you could be, you had to be, listen, if I'm going into battle, I want to be sure that I'm not going to lose my head. Okay, that's rather important. And, and so it was not only beautiful and made it to show, but you know what? It was important. And it, it served a very important purpose. It would save their life. Okay, and so uh, that's what salvation will do when we put on the helmet of salvation. Okay, if you don't, if you don't understand and we don't walk in all that our salvation entails, then we're leaving ourselves open to the blows of Satan. And you know what it brings about in most people? Discouragement and doubt. Discouragement and doubt. It, probably every one of you have had occasion to witness to somebody and ask them the question, do you know if you died tonight? Are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And, 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 and you get the response, well, I hope so, or I think so. And, and, and you say, well, you know, uh, if, if anybody would give you a guarantee, you'd like to know what God says about that. And you share the scripture from them, and you go through the plan of salvation and show them how they must know Christ as their Savior, and they must call upon him and ask him to be their Savior. And at the end of that, they look at you and they say, well, I've already done that. You ever had that experience? And you say, but wait a minute, you weren't sure. You had a lot of doubt. And a lot of times it's because they never really understood what salvation really was. And what salvation was all about. And so we don't understand putting on the whole helmet of salvation. You see, Satan loves to attack the mind. He loves to attack our thoughts. And, and we're very vulnerable to that if we don't have on the helmet of salvation. I want you to look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Would you turn over there with me please? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here, the scripture says, notice with me in verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Why? Because we are in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of what? The snare of who? The devil. And they're taken captive by him at his will. When we deal with people who have believed the lies of Satan, and we've talked about this through this process, we believe his lie long enough, we believe it to be true. And it's not true, it's a lie. But you know, there's some people, and some of you have known situations where someone's believed the lie for so long, they think it's true. But it's not true. And so we have to be, we, we have to, how do you help somebody like that? You're not going to help them by saying, come on, man, what's wrong with you? That's not going to help them. The, the meekness here, and we learn about meekness is, is like a lubricant. The meekness is that thing that, 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 that is able to, to, to make things work without causing friction. And so you've got to be a lubricant to, between that person and, and trying to, why? They're opposing themselves. They're having a wrestling match with themselves. We'll talk later on tonight about the double-minded man. But, but they're opposing themselves. They're taken captive by him and his will. And what it means is they believing they've been deceived by Satan. The problem's deception. And he's got them believing something that's not true. 
And so let's, let's look at this tonight. Number one on your paper there, if you're going to fill that out, is Satan seeks to attack our minds. You know, physically, our head is one of the most vulnerable spots. That's why soldiers wear helmets. That's why football players, baseball players, will wear protective helmets. If the, you know, if the head is severely injured, it's very difficult for the rest of the body to function. I read of a young man who was injured in an industrial accident in a warehouse. A heavy barrel fell 40 feet and hit him, breaking his back in several places. The doctor said he would have recovered from those injuries, however. The worst was the trauma to his brain. And when his brain began to fail, it wasn't long till the rest of his bodily organs began to follow. And death was inevitable. Well, the same is true spiritually. Okay? If Satan captures our minds with his lies, he'll soon control the entire person. He'll soon control everything you do. You know, I, I don't know if you ever worked in, in certain jobs. My, my first job as a teenager, my dad worked at a manufacturing company in Hartville, Ohio. It was F.E. Schumacher Company up in Hartville. And I worked in that, got me a job in the warehouse there when I turned 16. And we loaded trucks. It's a manufacturing, and they did uh, screen doors and uh, uh, shutters and all those kind of wood products and such. But they had warehouse where things were stacked way high and you had to run forklifts and things like that. So it was required everybody who works in the warehouse had to wear a hard hat. Had to wear a hard hat. I didn't like that. I'm a teenager, you know. I didn't like wearing it. But you know what? If I don't want to work there, I'm wearing a hard hat. It was required. If you don't wear a hard hat, that's great. You don't work here. Now that's just the way, that's just the way it is. And so just, but listen, just as urgent as that would be, just as urgent as some companies are to say, you will wear a hard hat. We ought to be just as diligent and just as urgent that we put on the helmet of salvation. That we understand how important that is uh, in our life. That urgency of putting on the helmet. You know, the Bible says, James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his mind. A double-minded means you live in two minds. Okay, you're living in two different minds. One mind's telling you one thing, and another mind's telling you something else. It's really spiritual schizophrenia. You're a spiritual schizophrenic. And, and, and the truth is, what it is, is part of you, one of your mind is telling you what God says, and the other part's telling you what Satan says. And, and you're listening to both of those. And so what, what we find is, David, for example, uh, David in the Psalms, and I don't think I wrote the verse down. David prayed in Psalm, I want to say it might be, let me, let me look real quick and see if I, I think of where it is. I just read it. Let me see if I get it right. All the things I miss, I miss my mind the most. But. It is, Psalm 86, verse 11. David says, teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Now listen, unite my heart to fear thy name. David says, here's what I'm asking you, God. Unite my heart. Unite my heart and my mind that I will fear your name. I don't want to be double-minded. I don't want to, I don't want to have that conflict going on. It's, it's faith and it's doubt. It's believe God and then I'm not sure I'm going to believe God. Uh, should I trust God? Should I not trust God? I can have victory and then the next minute I can be sinning and going against God. Do what God wants, but also do what I want. Listen, if Satan can't control your mind completely, he'll take any part you're willing to give him. He'll take any part you're willing to give him. We, we had a, my wife had a phone call today and was talking to an individual who had left her husband and left her family and was trying to give all sorts of reasons why that that was right. And my wife was telling her, you know, there's other options that, that were available to you. And she says, oh, but my counselor told me. Okay, well, that opens something up right there, doesn't it? Her counselor wasn't anybody from church. It wasn't the pastor. It wasn't the pastor's wife. It was somebody else who gave her the counsel to take off and leave. You see? She, she opened herself up 
to ungodly advice. And she took it. Okay? And so uh, if, if you don't give him all your mind, he'll take whatever you want to give him. And he can, he can make a wreck out of things real quick. So he can tax our mind. Number two, Satan, listen, Satan can control the mind of a believer. Doesn't have to, but he can. You do know prior to being saved, we all were under Satan's control. You understand that, don't you? Look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians 2, notice with me verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, quickened is a word that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Yeah, that's Satan himself. And we walked according to that spirit of disobedience. That's, that's the control we were under. Among whom also we had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so we were, we were uh, the children of disobedience. We were, in fact, Jesus looked at people one day and he said, Ye are of your father, the devil. That's who our father was before we were saved. You may not like that. They may not sit well with you, but it's truth. All right? And so we, we accept that. Now, notice, notice Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then look at Colossians chapter 1. Again, it talks about how in verse 20 that Christ has made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile us to him. But now notice verse 21. Colossians 1 verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies, where? in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So I was an enemy and alienated, where? In my mind. The Bible says in Romans 8, verses 6 and 7, to be carnally minded is death. In fact, look, look at Romans chapter 8. Would you turn over there too with me? Aren't you glad you have a Bible? Romans, Romans 8. <coughs> Verse 6, the Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That carnal mind, that fleshly mind, is the enemy of God. Okay, My thoughts, my ways is the enemy of God's ways. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's against God's way. Okay? I mean, become an enemy in my mind. It's not subject to the law of God, notice, neither indeed can be. It can't be subject to the law of God because I've already made it subject to Satan. And I cannot be subject to two masters. So if I make my mind subject to Satan and to the course of this world, I cannot make it subject to the law of God. That's why it's so difficult sometimes when people, you fill your mind with television and fill your mind with the things of the world and you come to church and you think, oh man, this is boring. When will this be over? You have no desire for the law of God. And your mind won't be subject to the law of God because you've made it subject to the law of Satan. Boy, that's quiet. I can tell that was happy. Look at Acts chapter 5. Here's a great example of this. Acts chapter 5. Great things have been happening in the church of Jerusalem. They started out with their first big day at Pentecost and 3,000 were saved and 3,000 were added to the church. You find out they had more saved over in chapter 4 and chapter Five, you get to where there's some things happening in the church. A certain man, verse 1, named Ananias and his wife with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, 
and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. What had happened was these some people had decided to sell property, sell land, and they would just give the money to the apostles, and then they saw the needs of people in the church, and they would fulfill those needs. If uh, somebody needed that, needed something, they went and got, got it for them and gave it to them. Strictly a voluntary thing. Nobody made it mandatory. There's no rule here. And uh, this was just somebody doing it of their own free will. And so they did the same thing, except they weren't being honest about what they sold the price for. They sold the land for, let's say, you know, $10,000, but they told everybody they sold it for 5000 so they could give five and keep five for themselves. Okay? Now, it's been fine to say, hey, we sold the land for this much, but we've we got to pay some of this. We'll do something with this. We're going to give 5000 Praise the Lord. Nothing been wrong with that if they'd just been honest about it. But they weren't honest. And what happened? Why weren't they honest? Why would they lie about it? Peter said to Ananias, verse 3, Why hath who? Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Who made it? Who influenced Ananias to lie? Satan did. Who influences you to lie? Who influences me to lie? Yeah. It hasn't changed. He's a liar and the father of it. And so he influences our minds. These were believers. These were members of the early church. And Satan got them to lie. And so they thought, hey, they thought it was their idea. But it wasn't. It was Satan's idea. Sometimes we get, man, I got a great idea. You better make sure who it's coming from. You better make sure that that's a from God idea and not from a Satan idea. And I guarantee you this, if there's a lie attached to it, it isn't from God. If there's deception attached to it, it isn't from God. And so be, be aware that he can control your mind. And so don't allow that to happen. We'll talk about how that happens. Number three, the helmet that protects us is Jesus Christ. Because it's the helmet of salvation. But we're reminded that salvation is not something, it is someone. Salvation is Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2. Would you look there? Luke chapter 2. Jesus has been born, and they are bringing Him to the temple to dedicate Him. And there's an old man at the temple waiting. Anybody remember that old man's name? Simeon. He's been waiting. God had told him he's not going to die till he sees the Messiah. He sees God's salvation. What a promise that is. And so he's waiting. Verse number 28, Luke chapter 2. The Bible says, Then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Wait a minute. Mine eyes have seen your salvation. Who is he looking at? Jesus Christ. That's salvation. It's Jesus. The Lord is my light. Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? You know, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, meaning safety, deliverance, salvation. And that's exactly how you pronounce Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua. And so he's the one. Thou shalt call his name Yeshua, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What a Savior. Now listen, true salvation causes somebody to rescue you from a situation in which you are helpless. True salvation causes someone to rescue you from a situation in which you were helpless. The example, of course, is when someone's drowning. When someone's drowning and there you see them go down for the third time, they're not coming back up. And that, that person has to go in, jump in, get to that person, and then bring them safely to shore. Or they haven't saved them. And nobody goes out as someone's going under the third time. The lifeguard doesn't go out and grab you by one arm and say, okay, now I'll take a stroke and you take a stroke. 
Come on, you got to help me out here. Help me out. No. In fact, if anybody been a lifeguard here, what do you tell the person you're trying to rescue? Yeah, don't do anything. Just stop trying. Just, just don't do anything. Because you can't save them if they're still trying to save themselves. They can end up drowning you and them. That's salvation. We were lost and undone in sin. Unable to do anything on our own at all to save ourselves. Or to help ourselves. We needed somebody to come to us and save us. And rescue us. And that was Jesus Christ. He did it. And He does it all. We couldn't rescue ourselves. We needed a Savior. He is salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, Acts 4.12. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. Only Jesus Christ. Now, after salvation, there's still areas in which we're unable to save ourselves. And one of those areas is our mind. So we find out that number four on your paper there is Jesus Christ protects our minds. The best way to keep Satan's thoughts out of our mind is to keep Christ's thoughts in our mind. Now here's the difficulty. Unlike Satan, Jesus Christ never intrudes. Jesus Christ never forces himself on anybody. Satan will. He'll horn his way in any way he can. He'll push his way in any way he can. And he'll, he'll work his way into your life any, way, any, any crack or crevice you give him. But we have to invite the Lord Jesus in. We have to give him the invitation because he's a gentleman. And so we have to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so we're, we have to consciously let that happen. This is where 2 Corinthians comes in, how we, we bring every thought into captivity and we, we bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. In other words, when we have to constantly, when a thought comes and we know that this is not true, this, is not, this doesn't line up with what I know to be true about God, we consciously cast that thought out and say, no, that's wrong. That's a wrong thought. That's wicked. I cast that thought down. Lord Jesus, replace that with the right thought. And we consciously say that. And that's okay. Replace it with what's right and what's true. And there's no way to put, listen, there's no way to put the thoughts of Christ or the mind of Christ in your mind if you don't put the Word of God in your mind. There's a, there's a, there's a real closeness between the living Word and the written Word. The written Word and the living Word. They go hand in hand. And so you're not, you're not going to have a close relationship to Christ and have a far relationship from His Word. It won't happen. If you want to be, I just want to be close to Jesus, then get close to His Word. And boy, His mind will become your mind. But you can't separate the two. So when I memorize and I meditate on the Word of God, and then I'm putting the mind of Christ into my mind, I'm beginning to change my thinking pattern. We, we deal with this in, in Reformers Unanimous, but the truth is it's, it's something that ought to be dealt with in everybody's Christian life. They say that, you know, when I was a kid, uh, we lived in Uniontown, Ohio, and not, not far from where we lived, uh, there was a swimming place called Clearwater Park there on 619. Brother Dave would know where that is. And, and uh, they had a miniature golf course there. We would go up and play miniature golf often in the summer. The problem is we just took the same way. We took the same path. We didn't go out to the street and walk. We cut through yards, baby. And, uh, you know, yards, trees, woods, and we took the shortcut, you know. Uh, and the problem was we, we had some, a couple neighbors who didn't appreciate us going through their yard the same route every day. Why is that? Yeah, we started wearing a path right in their backyard. And he didn't appreciate that. And he'd always, he'd always yell and scream at us when we'd walk into the yard. And, and listen, they tell us that your thoughts are the same way. They tell us that as you think, you, you, your, your, your mind develops 
little ruts that your thoughts run that way. That's why there's certain, certain things that happen or certain situations. People, people, how many of you used to smoke? You don't smoke now, but you used to. Let me see your hand, okay? And you know what happens? There, there were certain times when you would quit smoking that, that right after a meal, or right after that, boy, those thoughts would start running. Why? That's the path they always ran. Whenever it is that you always wanted to have a cigarette, you had to redirect those thoughts and start running them on another path. That's not, that, that's not, that's not easy at first. But the longer you walk that path and the longer you make yourself go down that path, guess what? The rut starts growing that way. That's why, that's why it, at first when you get saved and you start out coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that's hard. You think, man, what is this? I thought you only had to go for an hour on Sunday. What do you mean Sunday night? What do you mean Wednesday night? What's that all about? But once you get that thought process going, now there's numbers of you attest by the crowd here tonight who it's not even a thought. You know what? It's Wednesday night. We go to church. It's not a, it's not a am I going to go? Should I go? Is it? Oh, it's Wednesday. No. It's just, hey, it's Wednesday night. We're going to church. See, because you've developed that thought pattern now, and it's, it's a well-worn path in your brain. And so we have to begin to, through the Word of God, direct our different thoughts. Your living never changes until your thinking changes. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible talks about how you, you, renew, you, you renew your renewing of your mind in, in uh, Romans 12, too, to, to do the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But you won't do that until you renew your mind, until you begin to change your thought pattern. And you do that by memorizing and meditating on the Word of God. Read it and study it and memorize it and meditate on it. It'll change your thinking. And then it changes your living. You think differently, you'll act differently. That's how you, listen, that's how you protect your mind from the control of Satan. It'll stay under the control of Christ if you'll do that. Now, Number five, also is this. The hope of salvation also protects our minds. The hope of salvation. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Would you look there please with me? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. By the way, the context here, if you notice, in verse 1, he talks about the times and the seasons. Brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But brethren, you are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. <coughs> when the Bible talks about darkness, it talks about people who don't have any spiritual direction. That's what happens when people are in darkness. They have no spiritual direction at all. When we talk about people in the light, it means people who do have spiritual direction. All right? That's us. We have spiritual direction. So what does it say? He's saying that we're, we, we're not in darkness. The day should overtake you as a thief. We're all the children of light and children of the day and not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. We're looking for that day, for the day of Christ, for them to come. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken, be drunken in the night. Now watch verse 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about his appearing. He's talking about when he returns. And we know that when he returns for us, according to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive remain, we'll be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. Now, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this says when we rise, that this mortal is going to put on immortality and this corruptible is going to put on incorruption he says we will we, we will not all sleep but we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye that's going to be the redemption of our body that's going to be the fullness of our salvation 
my spirit, here, here's, what I, here, here's what you have to understand. My spirit was saved the moment I trusted Christ as my Savior. Spirit was born again. That, that's what he makes alive. And the spirit is that part of man which communicates with God. It's our spirit that bears witness with, or his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it's his spirit bearing witness with our spirit. But we have a soul. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. You know what that is? That's in the process of being saved. That's, the Bible calls it sanctification. It's, it's learning to think, having the mind of Christ. Learning to have a heart after God. See? Learning not to follow my emotions and my flesh, but follow what God wants. And that's a process that takes place. That's going to be completed when we get to heaven as well. But wait, the last thing that's going to be completed is our body. Okay? The body isn't saved. Okay? The body's, the body's wearing out. Huh? Say something to Brother Pax tonight. He goes, huh? Huh? Yeah. You know what that is? That's just the body. The body's wearing out. He said, this ear doesn't hear so good anymore. What's well, the same age as this ear? How come this one can't hear and this one can? We don't understand that. But you know, things begin to ache and hurt, and it's just your body telling you, hey, man, it's, you know what? It's groaning. It's, it's waiting for the redemption when we'll get a new body. And that's going to be, that's a glorious hope. That's something that you don't forget. That's something you hold on to, the, the hope of our salvation. Sometimes you, you feel lost. Uh, uh, sometimes you feel forsaken. Sometimes you feel like maybe the enemy's winning. But don't forget, you have the hope of salvation. Hey, God has given us uh, the victory over the penalty of sin. He's giving us victory over the power of sin. One day He's going to give us absolute, complete victory over the presence of sin. And, and we won't have to deal with sin anymore at all. Hey, that is not a something. That's not just a hope so thing. Listen, the, the hope in the Bible is a surety. It's different than what we use. Oh, I cross my fingers. I hope this works out. That's not the way hope is used in the Bible. The Bible talks in Hebrews that it's this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. You don't anchor your soul on, on a four-leaf clover or a horseshoe in your pocket. Cross my fingers, hope to die. That's not, that's not the hope that the Bible talks about. It's a surety. It's, that's why it's the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not a hopeful thing. Oh, man, I hope he comes. No, no, no. He's coming. There, there's no hope to that. It's a blessed hope that this body is going to get, finally, salvation. It's the body is going to be saved. And I'll have complete salvation. Listen, though, though sometimes you get discouraged, so sometimes it feels like you're losing the battle. Sometimes you feel a little bit forsaken. And maybe that the enemy's ahead. Listen, you never lose hope because we have the helmet of salvation on our head. We have full knowledge that Christ has won the battle. We have full knowledge that we're going to win in the end. We have full knowledge that we have a complete salvation. I have full knowledge that He will never leave me nor forsake me. Hebrews 13. Would you look there with me please? Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Notice the Bible says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Oh, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He never leaves me, never forsakes me, never leaves you, and He'll never forsake you. What's that mean? I don't fear what man shall do unto me. I have the helmet of salvation on my head. I know what salvation's all about. And again, it's a matter of me aggressively, uh, purposefully putting on that helmet each and every day. Hey, each and every day you get up realizing, I'm saved. I'm never going to go to hell. Hey, I'm saved. I have power over sin today. I do not have to sin today. I do not have to, to, to succumb to Satan's deceptions today. I don't have to follow the lusts of the flesh today. And 
then I have that hope one day Jesus is going to come. We're going to rise to meet him in the air. And this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. And I'll get a glorified body. Won't have to struggle with these things anymore. What a day that'll be, huh? So we, we, we take Christ. He's the helmet of salvation. His word, his power, his presence, and his promise. He'll protect us from the attack of Satan. And we'll keep our head about it. Because listen, you've got to keep your head. And, and so often, Satan starts with doubts. Doubts in our head. So make sure you put that helmet on. It's, it's ornate. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It'll make you stick out. Everybody will see you. Everybody ought to know. There goes, there goes one of those born-again Christians. That's okay. See? See, that's the Lord Jesus. What a Savior. Take the helmet of salvation. Next week, Lord, well, next week we'll have the Thanksgiving service. The following week we'll talk about the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. All right, let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us to be very aware of this helmet of salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our salvation and that we can have the mind of Christ in us. We don't have to be deceived. We don't have to be beguiled through the subtlety of Satan. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God, that He will help us to have the mind of Christ. Oh, make us people of the Bible. Make us people who love Your Word. Don't let us give lip service to loving Jesus when we don't spend any time with Your Word. Lord, change our thinking. And as You change our thinking, may we see the change in our living. And may we live lives that honor and glorify You. Give us victory as we leave this place tonight. And I pray that each one of us in the morning would be very conscious as we wake up to put on the helmet of salvation. We love you, Lord. Thank you for a good service together here this evening. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground. Let's sing that together, shall we? Let's hear you sing. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord plant my feet on higher ground ground. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, you can come right on up.